Hi, my name is Maimoni Niet. And I am Ali Al Nazani, and we are from the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Cambodia. Today, we're going to have an interview with Mr. Josh Onstad, who is the head of the Marek Area Fair and Officer Justice at Raoul Wallenberg Institute. And the topic that we are going to discuss is one that is currently debated in Sweden and in Cambodia, and it's about national human rights institutions. So, first of all, Jos, before we um, go into discuss in detail about today's topic, we would like to know what is a national human rights institution. So, national human rights institutions, or NHRIs, are bodies that are mandated by the state to promote and protect human rights domestically. Um, true NHRIs are, are characterized by having a broad human rights mandate, being able to cover civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights, as well as being independent, particularly from the government. Uh, the NHRI movement has grown uh, over the last 30 years or so, and today there are some 118 bodies that are recognized to some extent as being an NHRI, and they play a critical role in addressing issues in relation to not just national human rights law and standards, but also regional and particularly international standards. How many different types of national human rights institutions are there? Is there a specific type or model or structure to be followed? There's no specific model required for NHRIs. They come in all shapes and sizes, but most of them tend not to be very large. The models we often see are human rights commissions or ombudsman institutions, typically with different commissioners or ombudsmen addressing different areas of the NHRI's mandate. Some of them are formed from existing institutions or the merger of existing institutions, and many have specific departments or sections set up to address relevant international obligations, such as having a national preventive mechanism uh, under the Convention Against Torture, which monitors conditions of detention, or national mechanisms set up under the Convention for Rights of People with Disabilities. There are also a number of important networks of NHRIs uh, at the international level, the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions, GANRI. Then there are also regional networks in Europe, the Americas, Africa, and in Asia, the Asia-Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions. From my understanding, there is an international set of rules for the national human rights institution, which is called the Paris Principle. So, could you please tell us what are the Paris Principles? The Paris Principles are the name uh, given to a set of criteria adopted by the United Nations some 30 years ago uh, that set out what a national human rights institution uh, should look like. Uh, there are many criteria, but amongst the most important are that an NHRI uh, should be established by law or even in the Constitution. It should have a broad human rights mandate and be able to address any issue of human rights that arises. It should exhibit pluralism. It should represent all sectors of society. It should be independent, and particularly from the government. And it should have necessary financial resources and financial autonomy. Uh, it should uh, be able to cooperate uh, both domestically and with international organisations. Uh, and it should also provide annual reporting on human rights issues within the country concerned. Are all national human rights institutions required to comply with the Paris Principles? So the Global Alliance of NHRIs, GANRI, um, has the function of accrediting institutions as to whether or not they comply with the Paris Principles. It can award A status to institutions that comply in full with the principles and B status to ones that comply partially. As of last year, it had reviewed uh, applications from some 128 different institutions for accreditation, of which 86 are now considered A status NHRIs, 32 are B status, and 10 have not been accredited. The accreditation is very important. Of course, it uh, conveys uh, authority upon the institution concerned and endows it with a certain degree of trust, both within the country concerned and also internationally. A-status NHRIs also are able to have a speaking status with the Human Rights Council and in front of UN treaty bodies, 
um, as well as uh, voting rights and memberships of Gannery and some of the regional networks as well. Moving on to the next question, we just heard the news that Sweden has decided to establish a national human rights institution. So we would like to know why does Sweden need such an institution? Well, Sweden has a reputation for being good with human rights and indeed does a lot of work promoting human rights in other countries around the world. But that doesn't mean Sweden doesn't have human rights problems of its own. And indeed, if those problems exist, this would suggest that not enough is being done to address them. And one part of the solution might be, based upon the experience of other countries around the world, to establish a well-functioning NHRI in Sweden. There have been calls for this for many years, both domestically and internationally, and a lot of pressure, including through the UN Universal Periodic Review Process, where numerous countries have recommended that Sweden establish such an institution. Some 10 years ago, a body called the Equality Ombudsman in Sweden actually applied for accreditation as an NHRI, but only received a B-status accreditation due to concerns that it didn't have a broad enough human rights mandate and was insufficiently independent from the government. This was, of course, very embarrassing for Sweden, and efforts continue to try and develop an independent institution. In 2021, a law was passed uh, enacting the new Swedish Institute for Human Rights, as it's called, which then came into operation on the 1st of January 2022. There remain, however, a lot of questions about this new institution. First of all, what it will actually do, given that there are a number of other bodies, such as the Equality Ombudsman, which already have human rights mandates, as well as to whether it will actually secure that A status accreditation, given concerns also about its own potential independence from the government. How do you think countries like Cambodia could benefit from the existence of a national human rights institution? Well, we've seen that when NHRIs do comply with the Paris principles, they can really make a significant contribution to improving the situation of human rights in a country, from individual cases of violations right up to influencing national law and policy. With a broad enough mandate, they can address issues ranging from the rights to education and health care, through key freedoms such as uh, expression and assembly, uh, right to the most serious cases of human rights violations such as torture and extrajudicial killings. But it's critical uh, that they do exhibit that genuine independence from the government, including when it comes to financial resources, because even the best looking NHRI on paper uh, is powerless unless it has sufficient and independently guaranteed resources. And it's also crucial that the NHRI has teeth it is able to take genuine action that its recommendations are respected by the authorities within the country concerned. So thank you so much Jos, for spending time with us today and also for your comprehensive answer to our interview. Uh, we believe that it will be beneficial to the public who are so curious about the topic of national human rights institution. And that's all for today. Thank you. <laughs>